Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this World of Warcraft raiding guide. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the 10 man normal mode version of the Spirit Kings in the Mogushan Volts raid. In order to complete this fight, we used one tank, three healers, and six DPS. However, at a push, you could go for two healers depending on how well geared they are. So, in this fight, you will face four different bosses, although that's all kind of comprised into one encounter, and these are the Spirit Kings of Pandaria Pass. And all in all, it's a relatively fun fight. It does require quite a bit of movement and coordination. However, it is relatively simple on the normal mode version. As per normal, first of all, we're going to take a look at the list of the boss's abilities, and then we'll take a look at how to actually defeat the encounter. The first ability that this boss has is called King's Procession, and this is kind of the core ability for the encounter, and it's what makes it fun and entertaining, unless you're a healer. And uh, this basically means that You'll, you'll fight one boss at a time, one will spawn, you'll kill it off, and then the next one will spawn. These bosses will spawn in sequence, so four of them will spawn. However, when one of them's killed off, one of its core abilities will stick with the rest of the encounter. So when you're on the last boss, you'll have that boss's core abilities, and then you'll have one ability from the th previous three bosses that you've killed. So in no particular order, as that's the way the bosses spawn, the first abilities we're going to look at are for Meng the Demented, and his first main ability is called Maddening Shout. And this is effectively like a mini mind control, except you don't get mind control, but all of the people in the raid become hostile to each other. And this ability will inflict 65,000 shadow damage every 3 seconds, and the only way for this debuff, so to speak, to be taken off each other is to have 40,000 damage inflicted from another player. So just stack up is the easiest way I guess. The, the only time you wouldn't stack up is if you're in looking for raiding people are chasing chickens and such. But yeah, this is normal mode. So stack up on one point, as you can see, well, we have one person marked with a blue marker. We'll just stack up on him and use some simple AoE skills. His next ability is called Crazed. And this boss has an insanity bar basically. And every 0.5 seconds, he'll become more and more crazed and this will increase his physical damage dealt by a percentage equal to twice of his current insanity so if he is dealing so if he is at five insanity i believe that means he'll be dealing 10 percent more physical damage and this will start to really really hurt now when he reaches 100 insanity he kind of has two stances he'll switch his personality which is the stance kind of thing to cowardice and again every 0.5 seconds he'll become more and more insane and this time his insanity bar is damage reflected so every percentage of insanity he has will be a percentage of damage reflected back to you. Now when he's nearing 100 insanity, you do need to kind of watch out. Because if you're critting for, what, 190k's, 200k's these days, I think it is, then you're going to be dealing a lot of damage to yourself and your healers aren't going to be happy. And his final ability is called Crazy Thought, and this is something that he casts. It is interruptible and this will just increase his insanity by 10. And you don't really want this in either of his stances, in either his crazed or cowardice stance. When you've defeated Meng the Demented, the ability that will remain throughout the rest of the encounter is his maddening shout, so you'll be stacked up for the majority of this encounter. The next boss goes by the name of Krang the Merciless, and I've probably just horribly mispronounced his first name as I normally do with most of these women bosses. And his first ability is called Flanking Orders. And this is effectively a line of Mogu attackers that just charge at you with swords and daggers, waving them around like we're going to kill you. And it's not actually like that, so don't actually look out for that in the encounter. And this wave of Mogu attackers will inflict 500,000 physical damage to any enemies that are in front of them. So this is pretty much going to kill you if you get caught by it. So just look out for it and move. So all you have to do is relatively simple, just make sure someone's calling it out over your team speak or your vent or whatever you use. The boss's next ability is called Massive Attack, and this is another reason for you all to stack up, because no one can take this attack on their own, pretty much. It will inflict 800,000 physical damage, however this is split among everyone that he hits. So if you're stacked up and he does this 10 man raid, you're going to take 80,000 physical damage each, that's kind of bearable for your healers I think. At a push, they might go, Oh, that's too much. Can we stop it, please? And the boss's third and final ability is called Annihilate. And this is a frontal cone kind of ability which has a cast time to it. And it will inflict 1.5 million damage to any enemy that's in front of him. 
you just need to move out of the way of this. We found it easiest to stand in front of the boss to take the massive attacks and then just move behind him for when he casts Annihilate. When you uh, defeat this boss, his flanking order's ability will be the one that remains throughout the rest of the encounter. The next boss goes by the name of Subtai the Swift, and again, these names are getting really, really awkward to pronounce. And his first ability is called Pillage, and this is where he'll target a random player, and he'll kind of run to them and do a whirly-whirly spinny-spinny thing on top of them. And if you're caught in the whirly-whirly spinny-spinny, you will have 50% reduced healing, and you will take 50% more physical damage. He also kind of removes all your gear, so don't worry, you do get it back. Just, yeah, it'll hurt. And... This boss is kind of like the master of arrows. He's he's the Legolas of Pandaria. He's the Hawkeye of Pandaria. It's brilliant. I just thought of that. And his next ability is called Volley. And this is basically three volleys of arrows. And the first volley inflicts 100,000 physical damage to enemies in a large frontal cone, which are in front of him. Then 200,000 damage, physical, in a medium-sized cone in front of him again. And finally, a third wave of 400,000 physical damage in a small frontal cone in front of him. This is just a matter of making sure you're not caught in the wrong place at the wrong time and trying your best to avoid his, well, damage, which could inflict 700,000 physical damage to you if you get caught by all three, which will cause your healers to, you know, well, kill you, basically. And his third and final ability is called Rain of Arrows, and this is basically a, well, as it says, a Rain of Arrows at a player's location and uh, this will pin down a player. This, this ability has like a sub-ability called Pinned Arrow and this pinning arrow will hold a player in place and it'll inflict 30,000 physical damage every one second until someone's destroyed the pinned arrow. So when the boss is casting Rain of Arrows and it's been called out who's got pinned down, just make sure you swap to the arrow straight away and release him. Otherwise he's going to be taking a lot of damage and might not be able to move for other boss abilities. When you defeat Subtide the Swift, his pillage ability is the one that will remain throughout the rest of the encounter. And the fourth and final boss in this encounter goes by the name of Zian, I think, of the Endless Shadow. They should put a comma after his name and put in I think, it'd be kind of comedical, I guess. And his first ability goes by the name of Undying Shadows. And this is a mini ad that the boss will spawn, and this will fixate on a random player. This kind of links in with the sub ability Undying Shadow. And this mob obviously has health, I think it's around 200,000, maybe more, probably is more. And this will fixate on a person who needs to kite it around the room, because it will inflict 30,000 shadow damage to anyone that is standing within 10 yards of it. Now, after you've killed off this mob like thing, if you think back to Wrath and the Lich King encounter and the puddle thingies, he'll leave one of those on the floor and this will inflict damage to you if you do stand in it, so don't. It won't grow or anything though, so that's kind of a good thing. And this mob will come back with a vengeance as well, because after 30 seconds he will kind of bring himself back to life. He comes back to life over a period of 30 seconds and again it will fixate on someone and it will inflict 30,000 shadow damage to anyone standing near it again. His next ability is called Shadow Blast, and this is kind of a projectile that he launches at someone. And if it was to hit them, or anyone was standing in the vicinity of 8 yards where it landed, he would be hit for 100,000 shadow damage. However, I do believe this ability is interruptible, so do keep your eyes open for that. And his third and final ability is called Charge Shadows, and this will be targeted on a random player and it effectively just hits them for 100,000 shadow damage and it will also chain to other targets that are standing within 8 yards so you need to spread out for this and this is where the encounter kind of becomes a little bit of fun I guess you could say when this boss is uh, defeated he will maintain the undying shadows ability throughout the rest of the encounter So this, this fight, like I've said, does involve a lot of movement, unfortunately, but that could also be a good thing. It, it makes the fight a lot more interesting. Now, as I've said, the bosses can spawn in a random order, so I'll, in, in no particular order, I will just go through the bosses and how to kill them. So this first one we have here is Krang the Merciless, and again, probably pronounced it wrong. Now, what we have is someone marked with a blue square, and this is kind of the key person that we stack upon at all points. And this is mainly because of his Annihilate ability, and his massive attacks ability. 
when he casts Annihilate, it's got like a five second cast timer on it. It might be three seconds, possibly. And you just need to move to the other side of the boss. Like we stand in front of him and move behind him in order to avoid the massive attack. And then we just stay stacked in that position until he casts it again. Then when he begins casting his flanking orders, we're all in the same position so we can also all move at the same time and stay together as a group. This benefits us heavily for when he casts his massive attack because this is damage that needs to be shared between everyone in the raid as it's well, it's 800,000 split damage. And you need to share this like between 8 people minimum for him to take 100k. You don't want people taking excessive amounts of damage because of the amount of damage later on in the fight. And again, we've had the second flanking orders here. We see where it's coming from and we can just move together as a group. Apart from the one person that ran to the right then. They, they did that wrong, but ignore them. Never mind. So that's that's the basis for Kang the Merciless. I'm just going to let the rest of the video roll on so you can carry on seeing how we do take care of the boss. As it is slightly beneficial. So now we're moving on to the second boss that spawned here, and we've got Meng the Demented. Throughout this phase, we do have to bear in mind that we will have the ability from Krang staying up, and that is his flanking order, so we do need to stay aware at all times. Now, for this phase, for, for this boss, you could stack up because of the abilities such as his Maddening Shout. Like, for example, he just cast Maddening Shout then. You need to get rid of it off all characters as soon as possible and just use some simple AoE for this. Now you can see here we've got flanking orders coming in, staying stacked up, it allows us to see where it's coming from and we can try and move as a group, except we didn't. Ignore that and move as a group, it will benefit you a lot. Now, the boss has got a rage kind of bar and he has the two phases, his crazed and his cowardice. He's just entered cowardice and this is where he will reflect damage equal to 50% of his current insanity, which is the rage bar. And when he reaches 100 insanity, he will obviously switch back to his craze stance. He has the crazy thought cast every now and then as well, which is a two-second cast. And if this cast is successful, his insanity will increase by 10. So this will obviously be higher damage reflected faster. And also, if he's crazed, it will be higher physical amounts of damage cast earlier on, if that makes sense. So you won't really be prepared for it, so to speak. So you do want to have, say... I think we had our rogue assigned to interrupting the crazy thoughts. It's just easier to have like a dedicated interrupter at all times. He does cast it quite a bit though, so you will m probably need more than one interrupter. And it doesn't matter if one or two get through that. It's not going to damage you that much. But it's just better to try and delay his insanity rising as much as you can. Again, the healing is just so much easier if you stay in stack to throughout this entire phase. So here we have Zian of the Endless Shadow spawning, and again this is the third boss that spawns, so we do need to bear in mind we will have two abilities from the first two bosses sticking with us throughout the rest of the fight. I believe it's the Maddening Shout and the Flanking Order still. So for this phase we decided to spread out with good reason. One reason is the uh, Undying Shadows that you've seen just spawn. That's a skull that targets on one random player and it will chase them around the room. They then need to just kite it around the room and it needs to be DPS down as fast as possible. When it is DPS down, it will leave a little kind of black puddle on the floor, which doesn't look great, but just don't stand in it. It deals moderate damage to you. And over a period of 30 seconds, the skull will come back to life, so you do need to be aware of this, because when it comes back to life, it will fixate on someone else and it does need to be killed off again, again at the side of the room. Now, as you saw, we had the maddening shout as well. This is kind of just a matter of you need to react fast on breaking the maddening shouts and if you're not that well grouped up just kind of 
DPS down, single target the people that are not standing within a group. Again, the Undying Shadows are spawning, and we also need to stay spread out because of the Charged Shadows ability, which is where the boss will just randomly attack one person. And this damage can be dealt to other people that are standing within 8 yards. So do stay spread. You need an 8 rod yard radius. As you can see, I use Deadly Boss mods. That's put a range indicator up. And as you just saw on the screen as well, the first undying little shadows skull thing spawned again. We just need to DPS it down. And we do have two puddles, so obviously we have two skulls, but they are on separate timers. A third one's just spawned, so phase four is going to get a bit tricky with the shadows, but you do need to communicate well in order for it to be successful. Now here, we had a few problems with the maddening shouts becoming a bit more of a problem. And some people didn't get broke as fast as they should have been. However, we managed to somehow pull through. There was a lot of hard heal. And finally, for the fourth and final boss, we had Sutai the Swift. Now again we remained spread out for this because of abilities from previous bosses, however that volley ability that you just saw can deal a lot of damage and if you're all stacked up, granted you could move slightly but he could hit everyone in the raid. Now you just saw the pinned arrow pin down the hunter conveniently, the hunter getting pinned down by an arrow. And basically just swap to this, DPS it down, it doesn't have much health. And obviously Xian keeps the undying shadows through so you do need to make sure you're spread out and aware of killing these as well as also taking care of your maddening shouts and watching out for your flanking orders. It becomes a little bit hectic for the fourth and final boss but it, it is manageable. Especially if you can get the maddening shouts broken as soon as possible and you're aware of where the undying shadows are and you don't go standing in puddles of crap. Now for subtize abilities, again we stay spread out mainly because of the volley ability and also the pillage ability. Now the pillage is where he will kind of run at someone, he's doing it there on screen now, it's like a spinny spinny circle circle thing, and normally if a boss does a spinny spinny circle circle thing, I like to put that you spin me right round baby music in the background. I'm going to refuse to do that just for this informal video, so to speak. And yeah, it's pretty much from now on just a, a rinse and repeat, you just avoid what you're meant to avoid. Like there, the volley that hit me twice and it shouldn't have done. I should have moved for the second wave because he kind of targets it in the same location. It's just little things like that that you need to be aware of throughout the fight. And as you'll see, just as the video is about to end, it does get very messy near the end. And that is it for this guide. I, I hope it does help you in one way or another. And if it has helped you or any of my other guides have helped you, then please do feel free to subscribe to the channel. Hopefully the guides will be becoming more of a regular thing now and I'll stop slacking on them, but... As always, thank you for watching.